2002, my family started a um, not-for-profit foundation to preserve our family's collection of 19th century Civil War photography and uh, called the Missouri Queen Park Foundation and Gordon Parks, being a longtime family friend who I grew up with, um, asked if the foundation if the Missouri Coon Park Foundation would start a foundation to preserve his work and legacy on his death. Uh, in 2006, Gordon Parks died, and we formed the Gordon Parks Foundation four years after we formed the Missouri Coon Park. Um, and actually, uh, my grandfather uh, and Gordon died just two weeks apart in 2006. So, um, I, you know, I, there's a level of uh, personal um, responsibility that I have. Gordon Parks not only was um, somebody who I looked up to, but it's, it's the personal story of both my grandfather and Gordon. So, um, how many of you, since they're such a small group, have heard of Gordon Parks before and know his photographs? So, not, I'm going to go very quickly through, I, I put together a short PowerPoint of some of his iconic works to sort of give a quick overview of his um, career, but it's really hard to, in, in any presentation, to sum up Parks' career. Renaissance man. He lived to be 93 years old, and he was a filmmaker. He was a photographer. He was a musician, poet. Um, he he worked right up until the end of his life. He was doing painting at the very end of his life. And one of his early assignments was uh, for the Farm Security Administration in Washington D.C. That Roy Stryker, the head of the uh, administration, hired Gordon to uh, photograph uh, just working people in in, in Washington D.C. Gordon took this photograph of Ella Watson, who was a charwoman in the administration offices, holding a mop in a room, that he asked her to pose for this photograph. And it was uh, inspired by Grant Wood's American Gothic, hence the name Gordon Parks' American Gothic. In 1948, uh, Gordon went to go work for Life magazine. And Life's very first assignment for Gordon as uh, the newcomer on the staff was to go to Harlem and to uh, see crime and gangs and follow sort of specific leaders around and sort of get a sense of what was happening in Harlem. And Gordon uh, photographed Red Jackson, who you'll see here, who you see here, and it was one of the very first big assignments for life. Gordon would be photographing uh, crime in Harlem, but he would also be photographing fashions in France and in New York. And you know, one of his favorite uh, quotes was, you know, by day, morning, I'd be shooting the fashions of uh, downtown with reds of velvets of, in dresses, and then I'd be shooting reds of blood in the evenings. It was, you know, he was doing both fashions and crime. Uh, Gordon went to Rio de Janeiro in the 60s and photographed the Flavellas. Um, he uh, not only became a close friend with this young boy whose name is Flavio. He helped his family by becoming um, his guardian and bringing him to the United States and having him helped. He had asthma and was suffering in poverty. And I think that really speaks to what Gordon Parks was most of, of all. He was a humanitarian. And his work was all about helping others and what could he do to tell their story through his camera lens. This photograph was taken in 1956 in Mobile, Alabama, and it's um, entitled Mr. and Mrs. Thornton. It's one of Gordon's earliest assignments that he did in color photography, and it was for a project um, on the segregated South. And this is, um, you can see in this portrait, he followed the Thornton family around their segregated town and documented their day in life. And above them is their wedding portrait, which was spliced together because the two of them could never uh, they never had sat for a portrait. And um, part of what the foundation does is it keeps the entire integrity of the image and doesn't alter it. So you can see that the, you might be able to see that the, she's missing her nose here, within the pier in the, in the photograph. And when Life magazine uh, published it, they touched up her nose. So we wanted to show the authentic version of this picture. Gordon photographed civil rights movements, Malcolm X, he actually was the godfather to uh, one of Malcolm X's children. He photographed the great Muhammad Ali, and he, he just, they were close friends, and he would photograph him on, on, in the boxing ring and off, and, and uh, took hundreds and hundreds of pictures of him. So when the foundation was formed in 2006, the very first 
project we did was we had to catalog everything that was here. And we um, spent between 2006 and 2012 strategically doing that and making sure that we had everything properly housed in climate controlled box uh, rooms and uh, uh, you know preservation boxes and created a d database for all the work and made sure that before we set out to do any publications or uh, museum exhibitions that we were up and running. So that's what we did in the very beginning of the foundation. And then in 2010, uh, we started working with Gerhard Steidel, and we decided that for Gordon's centennial in 2012, we would publish this five-volume box set edition of Gordon's photographs to celebrate his 100th year and to formally put Gordon um, back into the realm of photography as a uh, master of the 20th century and to um, this book would serve as a roadmap for curators and scholars and students to sort of understand at a large angle the work that Gordon Parks did. So in 2009, I sent Gerhard a fax. I said, foundation, we do, would you be interested in doing a book? No response. So six months later, out of the blue, I get this email from some assistant of Gerhard Steidel that will be in New York in a week, and can I please meet with him? We met. He came to the archives and he said, I want to do this book and I want to do it for the centennial. So for the centennial, when we released the five volume edition, we created this short video, just two minutes that I'd like you all to watch, that um, sort of sums up the process and working with Steidel and being in Germany and Göttingen and the collaborators who were part of the project. So let's just watch this two minute clip and then uh, I'll tell you more about the project at the foundation. Steidelbock is always produced in Göttingen, Düstere Straße 4, Germany. We are a publishing house where all the production on a book can be done in-house. We are developing and processing the photos digitally in our photo studio. Test prints on beautiful papers will show us how the book will look like. So this is now 9 point. Yes. Go to 8. What I do is produce things which hopefully last forever. This is just the first correction. Yep. I did some tests and I think that the size is quite nice. This is so-called library cloth mm -hmm. yeah, that is a little bit waxed on yep. top, yeah, so uh, something very solid. For the box. Can you imagine something like yes. this? Yes, yep. I'm doing the book for me and for the artist. The collected works of Gordon Parks is a a complete overview of, of his work. So here same we have width. the same uh, space. Yep. Smart. And now, same space. Yep. And here it is larger. I really believe that uh, a younger generation by today all around the globe will discover him as that what he is, a great photographer. Gordon Parks was with his camera a fighter on the right side. He was fighting for human rights and for a better life of those people who are not on the sunny side of the world. The people he photographed uh, trusted him. They had 100% faith. One of my dearest advisors is Karl Lagerfeld because he has a deep knowledge and he knows everything about photography and books and uh, when I told him about my uh, research at the Gordon Parks Foundation he was immediately thrilled and said I can't wait to see the book released. Mm -hmm. And we have prepared a layout so this is a book size yeah, and I we like have five movie. books like in a box. Movie. I think the size is perfect. Huh? I love this yeah, yeah. I think they're yeah. beautiful photos. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. We are working very hard to release Gordon Parks five volumes box set edition and uh, when it is ready, I will have a toast and a drink on his work and his life. Happy 100th birthday, gone. So 
that gives you a, a, uh, a little snippet into the, the uh, work that went into that publication. Um, there's the final book, if you have seen it here. And what, the, what we did is we chronicled uh, Paul Roth, who is the, uh, he, he's now the director of Ryerson Image Center in Toronto. He was the co-editor with me. And what we did was we chronicled Parks' career, and then the fifth volume, was uh, all of the Life magazine articles that Parks had written or published uh, to put as facsimiles in order to put the plates uh, into context. So once we uh, completed the uh, box set, um, and it was a roadmap for scholars and students, we decided to, it was then time to launch our exhibitions program. And the very first exhibition that we did was with the Studio Museum in Harlem with Thelma Golden. She decided to work specifically on um, the Fontenelle family, a family that Gordon documented uh, their struggles and hardships in Harlem in 1967. And um, she wanted to focus just on this one particular story. Um, here's the family at the poverty board. It's, you know, they were, they had lost their home. Gordon was uh, a friend of theirs, but also, you know, took pictures, didn't take pictures of them in their, in their worst conditions and really uh, developed a bond with the Fontenelle family. But uh, Thelma curated this in a way that she was telling just this specific story. Uh, you saw this picture in the clip. This is Gordon with the Fontenelle family looking um, at um, his camera. In 2013, uh, we published the second of this series of focus books on Red Jackson. Harlem Gang Leader, which was the first, the second picture that you saw at the beginning of the PowerPoint. And this was curated by Russell Lord, who's the curator at the New Orleans Museum of Art. And uh, instead of just taking it from the angle of a very focused body of work, um, Russell analyzed uh, the process in which the editors of life told this story and was what was their making of an argument and how, how did the life editor project what Gordon was uh, photographing versus what they were trying to tell, what kind of message they were trying to tell. So here's a, just a picture of, of Red Jackson, the gang leader that he was following around. But it was the first time that Russell had worked on a project where he was really looking at it through the lens of the life editor and how they altered the photograph in order to tell the story that they were trying to tell versus um, you know, the actual um, you know, reportage of, of the picture. This is Red Jackson in 2000, uh, I believe, seven, and he remained a gang leader in Harlem and a drug dealer his entire life. And Lyric Cabral, the photographer, actually went and found uh, Red and photographed him, and they included these in the publication, which it should be on this table. But um, Red. Uh, didn't continue conversations with Gordon. You know, he felt a little bit exploited by being used in life, but Gordon tried to mend ties with him towards the end, um, but it didn't seem to work. And Red died in 2008 at the 80s. The, in 14, we published a book with the High Museum on the segregation series that we talked about earlier, I talked about earlier. And uh, this, was our first project in color. Um, and this is probably one of the iconic photographs from the story of uh, Joanne Wilson with her niece under a colored entrance sign. And uh, we actually found uh, Joanne Wilson about five years ago, and we honored her at our gala in New York and gave her a picture of herself. And she talked to the audience about how moved she was to Gordon Parks and to be photographed by Gordon Parks and how that really impacted her life. And this, our event was in June and in August she died. All these deaths, I'm sorry. Uh, in 2015, this year, we published uh, the story of Back to Fort Scott, which was Gordon's hometown in Fort Scott, Kansas. And he uh, went back multiple times throughout his life to visit his family and his classmates. And the curator here, Karen Haas from the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, really focused in on what the story was that Parks was trying to tell and to have, have her uh, 
trace back the students in the different uh, his different classmates. I believe there were 17 classmates, and Parks went back for life in 1949 to see where his classmates were and what they were doing, and only two of them still lived in Fort Scott. All the others had had to move out for various work commitments. But Parks then went to Detroit and to Chicago and to other suburbs of um, or surrounding areas to, to Fort Scott and tracked them down. And this book tells the story of their lives in Fort Scott. And then again, the woman in the left and the little girl this was Parks' classmate, and this was his daughter, her daughter. And when the show at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston happened, the little girl, her name is Barbara Bailey, called us and said, I'm the little girl on the photograph with the woman with the piano. And so last year, we recognized Barbara Bailey, and she came to our fundraiser and talked about Gordon Parks and how important that project was to her. And this was these were the banners outside of the museum uh, just a few months ago. The show closed, and uh, in September, and we'll be opening in Wichita, Kansas, in about three months. So, upcoming, we have lots of plans with Scheidel uh, to continue doing projects with him. We're doing a uh, exhibition with the Art Institute of Chicago on Parks' collaboration with Ralph Ellison in 1948 and in 1952. And then Flavio, who I showed you earlier, will be at the Getty and at the Ryerson Image Center later in the year. So well, the foundation, in addition to the exhibitions and our publications, we also provide scholarships to students in the arts. And Chiara Marta, the girl on the left, was our first recipient of the Gordon Park Scholarship um, that we partnered with Nikon to, to endow a fund for the scholarship. And she went on afterwards to continue her career in photography, and she's now the assistant editor of photography at Vanity Fair. And she credits her success to the foundation looking out for her and for her uh, seeing that she had an eye for photography. And she ended up coming back before she went to Vanity Fair and interning with us for two summers. Uh, on the right is, is the archive. Um, the archives are in Pleasantville, New York, which is about 40 minutes by train from here. Um, we have a small exhibition space in the front of our building. We're in an old, um, the old courthouse of the village of Pleasantville. And so the front is our exhibition space where we have four to six shows a year. Uh, and then we have a research study center in the back and then a cold storage facility for the collection. And then I end with this slide. So I just returned from uh, Chicago where two years ago I received a letter from uh, George Lucas and Melody Hobson uh, saying that they had given a $25 million grant to the University of Chicago to build a new arts hall in the name of Gordon Parks and would the foundation allow this to occur? And I thought, oh my God, someone's pulling a prank on me. What's going on? <laughs> and the email was from like Skywalker Ranch, so I was like, this is just so weird. So long story short, it was legitimate and they opened the building last week um, in honor of Gordon Parks. Uh, and Melody Hobson organized a panel discussion and talked about the relevance of parks today and had Samuel L. Jackson and uh, Janelle Monet and Jeff Coons and many others on this panel talking about the importance of and relevance of parks' work today. So it goes sort of full circle. Our, our, our role is really just the custodians of the work. We don't interpret the work. We make it available for scholars and curators to come in to see it to decide what they need to do, and we just help facilitate it. So um, that's us in a 20-minute talk. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Are you planning an exhibition in that space anytime soon? Yes, yes, so we already have Oh, in the school, yes. So we have a show up right now um, in the gallery in the in the school. And there's going to be a show in the space every September, October. So all the students coming into the school know who Gordon Parks is. And do you know what was the connection between George Lucas and Well, he Gordon is Parks. a filmmaker who was inspired by Gordon Parks um, and knew his work from early on. And Melody is an African American woman in Chicago. Uh, 
Gordon actually got his start in Chicago. And so they wanted to name the building for somebody other than the two of them. And this was who they mutually agreed upon. What type of themes did you use? Yeah, I didn't really talk about the films because this was really geared towards the photography component and the book component. But he did, uh, he did his, his first film was called The Learning Tree, which chronicled his life in Fort Scott, Kansas, as a young boy dealing with racism and hatred and bigotry and how his high school teacher told him you'd never, you'd never go to college and you know, he didn't have a high school diploma. And here's Gordon Parks at 93 receiving you know, 15 honorary doctorate and being one of the top you know, artists of our time. And he went on to do multiple films on chronicling his life in Kansas, his uh, Solomon Northup's Odyssey, which was the um, take for the new film that just last year came out on 12 Years a Slave that Steve McQueen did. Um, and then he did Shaft. I mean, how could we, you know, Shaft was the big film of the 70s. But, you know, his, he, he sort of dabbled in lots of different careers and was successful in them all. Sure. Was um, the scholarship program part of the initial inception of the foundation or that? We, uh, you know, the way it sort of worked was Gordon said, here's my work, here's my copyright, here's my stuff, you guys, create something that you think will work for the future. Continue to keep my work in the art marketplace, provide educational outreach, whatever that is. And we felt that creating scholarships with different institutions in the name of Gordon Parks was the best way to do it. So we, this Chiara was a photography scholar, but we also have a scholarship student. But we have scholarships with students at the Ghetto Film School in the Bronx, um, with dance schools in Harlem. So they, we cross all different disciplines um, in order to sort of bring forth the works. Is there a way to watch somewhere online to have a discussion with no. contemporary artists? Have OK, been? so this is the interesting thing that you say that, because um, there was no publicity for this event. It was not recorded. And the whole conversation was about preserving our past and to get everyone inspired by what's happened in the past. So somebody in the audience said, well, why is this not being recorded? Because in 50 years, people are going to want to look exactly. back at the inauguration <laughs> of Gordon Parks Arts Hall, and there's no tape. And they all kind of looked sort of blank-faced, not knowing how to respond to that. So there is no way to view it, because it doesn't exist. <laughs>
air. And I used to be terrified. Like, who is this? <laughs> um, but that's it. <laughs>